Welcome to Western Religions. This is a video series to accompany a semester long college course on Western Religions. Uh, this particular chapter, chapter one, also works as an introduction to Eastern Religions courses. Uh, specifically, the videos in this series are meant to accompany Oxford University Press's World Religions Western Traditions textbook, although I do add additional information of my own. Chapter one, introduction to religion. So this chapter is divided into five main parts. Uh, studying religion, so just religious studies in general. Definition of religion or what is religion? Why are humans religious in the first place? Some of the main types of religions and then a brief classification of some of the main types of religious beliefs. 1.1, studying religion. There are two academic disciplines or names that are relevant to this class. Comparative religion can be defined as an interdisciplinary field of scholarship that seeks to understand and compare religions from different cultures. It's similar to religious studies. Uh, only difference is comparative religion focuses on the compare and contrast between different religions. Here's a definition of religious studies that I came up with. The academic study of religion, which seeks to understand human beings, societies, and cultures through the study of religious beliefs and practices, and which incorporates scholarship from a variety of social and some physical sciences. So the main thing to keep in mind is that comparative religion and religious studies are interdisciplinary. What that means is they take information and they use methods from a variety of different sciences and other fields like anthropology, archeology, span area studies, such as Near East studies, history, philosophy, psychology, sociology, and others. As long as it's relevant to religion, it could be useful to religious studies. So why study religion in the first place? Some general reasons, uh, it will actually help you understand human history, society, culture a lot better. Uh, maybe even surprisingly so, especially since uh, in this video series, I'm going to take a historical approach to a large degree in examining the major Western religions. Um, there's also personal reasons that might apply. You will understand people's values and ideology better, people that you come into contact with, um, if you know something about their religion. As well, uh, studying religions, even ones that aren't yours, can give you an opportunity to reflect on, assess, and evaluate, or articulate even, your own religious beliefs and practices. Here is a map of the prevailing world religions by county or other national subunit. The darker the color, the higher the proportion of the population that belongs to the prevailing religion in that part of the world. Red is Catholic Christianity. Blue is Protestant Christianity. Purple is Orthodox Christianity. Green is Islam. Orange and brown are Hinduism. Yellow and ochre are Buddhism. And pink are Chinese and other East Asian religions, which are often a mix of Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, Shinto, and so forth. This course is going to focus on Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. You can see a small pocket of majority Judaism in the modern nation of Israel. A close-up on Europe, North Africa, and the Near East. This is going to be one of the main areas of focus of this video series. Again, red is Catholic Christianity, and you can see it's most common in Western Europe um, and parts of Eastern Europe like Poland. Purple are the various types of Orthodox Christianity. Um, blue is Protestant Christianity, which is prominent in Northern Europe. And green is Islam. You can also see a pocket of yellow or Buddhism uh, in one of the parts of the Russian Federation. That is a nomadic people who practice a form of Vajrayana Buddhism similar to that of Mongolia and Tibet. Section 1.2, what is religion? In this section, we're going to talk about the definition of religion. 
We can begin by looking at the etymology or history of the word religion. The English word religion comes from Latin religara, which means to bind or to bind back together. The ligara portion is related to the English word ligament, which is a tissue that helps bind bones together. There are two meanings that are suggested by this etymology. You might think of religion binding people to God or to sacred beings. And you might think of religion as binding people together. Both of these meanings are helpful in understanding religion. One word of warning is that even if you know the history of the word, and even if you're kind of speculating or coming up with conjectures of what the meaning is or should be based on that history, it doesn't necessarily tell you the way the word is used now. So etymology can be useful in understanding meaning, but it's not going to be definitive on its own. Religion basically cannot be defined completely precisely because it is a family resemblance concept. It doesn't work giving a list of essential properties. And this is not that unusual, actually. There are many concepts that can be defined given a list of essential properties, including all of those of mathematics and formal logic, and some of those of science. For example, you can define an element from the periodic table completely precisely and discreetly using its atomic number or the number of protons in the nucleus. Similarly, with all mathematical concepts, uh, and this is basically by design because mathematics is a formal system, they can be defined in terms of a set of essential properties. Example, triangle is a three-sided polygon. Now, both of those properties are necessary conditions for being a triangle, which means all triangles are three-sided and all triangles are polygons. Neither one is sufficient on its own because if you're just a polygon, you might not be a triangle. And even if you're three-sided, if the sides are curvy, for example, you would also not be a triangle. Together, however, those two necessary properties are jointly sufficient for being a triangle. A sufficient property is one or a set of properties that if you have it or them, that's enough. It suffices for being a member of a kind of thing. So it's often very useful to have these neat, tidy, precise, and complete definitions in terms of essential properties, but not all of our concepts work like that. There are several examples that can help illustrate why religion is not or probably not um, a discrete concept that can be defined in terms of essential properties. We can point to other social phenomena that resemble religion in some ways, but still don't seem to count as religions. And it is often the case with family resemblance concepts that they'll have fuzzy boundaries. So there can be things that are partially fitting, but not completely fitting the concept. One example is spiritualism, a cultural movement originating in the 19th century that advocates belief in ghosts or spirits and contacting them through seances or spirit mediums. This is still somewhat alive today, but it reached its peak in the mid to late 1800s. A second example of a cultural movement that partially fits religion but not entirely is New Age. This began in the 1960s and 70s and draws upon and mixes beliefs and practices from Asian religions like Hinduism and Buddhism, Western mysticism, and magical traditions, Native American religions, astrology, belief in UFOs, and the countercultural movement of the 1960s. Other examples of New Age beliefs and practices include uh, tarot, crystal healing, and such like. So uh, what both spiritualism and New Age have in common is they have some supernatural beliefs, um, some beliefs in spirits, for example, uh, some rituals even, but they don't fit enough of the concept of religion, enough of the important properties of religion to qualify as religion. But it does illustrate the fact that you can match the concept of religion to a greater or lesser degree. So I mentioned it before, but religion is probably best understood as a family resemblance concept. This term is from the philosophy of language. And what it means is that it's a concept defined not by essential properties, but rather by a network of overlapping traits that are shared to a greater or lesser degree 
by the things that fit the concept. Um, and the family resemblance idea is based on the analogy of family members who are related um, to each other biologically. They will not all have the same traits, so there will be no necessary or uh, sufficient properties for counting as a member of the family, but there'll be degrees of resemblance. Um, now, as you can see with the example or the analogy of family, even though the family is not a uh, discrete concept, it can still be useful to know what the common properties are of members of the family. Because for example, it might help you recognize someone as related because they have many of the traits common in the family, even if they don't have all of the traits of any other particular family member. What this means is that there's going to be a fuzzy boundary between religion and other areas of human belief and behavior, as seen in the examples of New Age and spiritualism. So what do we do if we have a family resemblance concept? How do we actually give a definition of it? There are at least three different solutions. One is to say, well, because you cannot define it in terms of essential properties, you can't give any definition at all. This is not very useful though. It doesn't really provide any clarity. A second solution is to create a technical definition where you do uh, acknowledge the fact that maybe in ordinary language or common usage, the word or the concept doesn't have um, a definition in terms of essential properties, but you create a technical version of the concept that does have a definition in terms of essential properties. And the latter, uh, this second solution is often uh, done by science in order to create more precise and complete definitions. But there's a third possibility as well. You can define the concept in terms of what you might call salient properties or important properties. These are characteristics that are common, noticeable, and important among members of the kind of thing. So I mentioned that science has some uh, concepts that can be defined in terms of essential properties like elements. Uh, you could give other examples too, like the nature of various subatomic particles. There aren't really going to be fuzzy boundaries over the difference between an electron and a proton, for example, at least not in most circumstances. But there are other scientific concepts like biological species that are actually fuzzy or family resemblance concepts, and yet they're still very useful. So there's no absolute distinction between dog and wolf. Um, if you look at the evolution of dogs through human domestication, a type of artificial selection, there was no discrete moment at which uh, the wolf uh, population that was being domesticated became dog. There's a gradual transition. Similarly, even today, um, there's a lot of overlap in the traits of dogs and wolves such that they can still interbreed and have viable offspring. Nevertheless, despite the fact that biological species are family resemblance concepts, they are still very useful. And so we don't just abandon them or say we can't define them at all. We use them as ways of quickly, efficiently indicating the likely, probable, or typical traits of members of the group being designated. And we can do the same thing with religion. So here's a list, my list of the salient properties of religion. This list uh, is probably not going to be agreed upon by everyone um, because of the family resemblance nature of religion. You could probably add or subtract a few properties from this list, and it would still be a reasonable attempt at a definition. Sacred, supernatural, ritual, sacrifice, morality, social, mysticism, myth, and symbol. The more of these properties a thing has, the more it counts as a religion. It's a matter of degree though. Let's talk about each of these salient properties one by one, starting with the sacred. Religions generally focus on worshiping, venerating, revering, or honoring sacred beings, such as God, gods, or spirits. And it's not always supernatural things, although it usually is. For example, in Buddhism, uh, the main sacred beings that are honored are Buddhas, enlightened beings who teach the path to enlightenment to others, and arhants, enlightened beings who followed the teaching of a Buddha to attain enlightenment. Um, and these are not always understood as supernatural beings, although it must be said in traditional Buddhism, Buddhas and arhants are generally regarded as having supernatural powers. So even then, there's a bit of a supernatural. 
So you can define sacred as something that has meaning or value beyond that of the ordinary world, which could be described in contrast as profane. And the idea here is that there's a categorical distinction in value so that they're incommensurate. So things of profane value cannot be traded off um, correctly against things of sacred value. Something of sacred value is always going to be categorically worth more than any amount of things of profane value. An example is that a religious person who believes Jesus is Lord and Messiah, uh, if they're sincere in that, they probably won't accept any amount of money in exchange for criticizing Jesus or abandoning their faith because that would be um, to violate that sacred value. And the Tridentine Mass, which is a form of Mass in the Catholic Church, is just an example of a sacred uh, ritual or a ritual involving the sacred. Uh, particularly, um, the Eucharist is the presence of God, which is a sacred being. So there are many types of sacred things. In general, sacred value, um, that's related to the heart of the meaning of sacred. It cannot be sacrificed or traded off for things of ordinary or lesser value. There are sacred times, which would be times of the day, week, month, or year associated typically with sacred beings. Sacred places would be locations like a temple, um, a church, a synagogue, a mosque associated with sacred beings, either where they dwell or where miracles were performed. There could also be locations connected to the history of a religion, perhaps where a prophet got a revelation or where some miracle was performed that could also be regarded as sacred. And then we could talk about sacred experiences or encounters between people and sacred beings. Number two, supernatural. Supernatural has a different meaning than sacred. One way of seeing this is that there could be sacred values that are not supernatural. For example, someone might regard human life itself as sacred, i.e. not worthy of being traded off for things of lesser value like money or convenience. But human life is not necessarily and not generally thought of as supernatural. Another example of a non-supernatural sacred value or thing could be patriotism, when people might regard devotion to or loyalty, loyalty to their country as a sacred value that they wouldn't betray or trade off for something of lesser value, but their country is not a supernatural phenomenon. Supernatural, we can define as having powers that go beyond that of the natural world. This gets tricky because the word nature and natural is multiply ambiguous. It has many different meanings. And in particular, when we want to contrast natural with supernatural, the sense of nature that we have to specify is pretty broad. But here's an attempt to do so. By natural, I mean falls under the system of causal laws that govern the physical world and that can be observed and measured through sense experience. So everything that seems to violate or go beyond or not be accounted for by the laws of nature would count as supernatural. And there's at least two ways of being supernatural. Number one, this is the one we probably most commonly think of, something that violates the laws of nature, like a miracle or a supernatural power, like being able to fly unaided or heal people or walk on water, etc. But there's a second way that something could be supernatural, not because it breaks or violates the law of nature, but rather because it's outside of or prior to the laws of nature. Examples of this could be a creator god or gods, or the Tao or way in Taoism. Um, the Tao is often thought of by uh, Taoists as being the source of natural laws and as thus not really being confined to or limited by them, even though it's the source of them. But in that sense, it still goes beyond nature. The picture shows Jacob wrestling with the angel of God, and I'm just using the angel as an example of a supernatural being. A third salient property of religion is ritual. We can define ritual as a fixed sequence of behaviors that has a meaning or purpose. Many rituals are not religious, such as singing the national anthem. A religious ritual is a fixed sequence of behaviors that has a sacred meaning or purpose and is directed to or invokes a sacred or supernatural being. Most religious rituals are directed to or invoke a sacred being, but there also could be religious rituals that are just devoted to or invoking a supernatural being. 
And the difference is that some supernatural beings like demons or possibly spirits of the dead or nature spirits, they might not always be regarded as sacred by religious people. Although that type of non-sacred ritual, uh, non-sacred supernatural ritual does kind of um, overlap the concept of magic as well. But an example of a religious ritual is Holy Communion or the Eucharist in Christianity. There are many ways of talking about different types of rituals. Here's one set of distinctions. We can talk about recurrent rituals that are performed at certain times of the day, week, month, or year. Some examples, uh, in Islam, there's Salat or daily prayer five times a day. Uh, weekly rituals, an example of that is the Sabbath or Shabbat in Judaism. And there are also festivals, which are usually celebrated annually, but they could be on other cycles too. An example is the Christian festival Christmas that celebrates the birth of Jesus. Uh, a second type of ritual is done at specific points in the life cycle or at certain life stage events, such as birth, naming, coming of age, marriage, or death. Uh, one example of that is the sacrament of holy matrimony. And then a third category I call as needed rituals. This is where the frequency is not dictated by a regular cycle nor stage of life, but rather just based on events in an individual person's or a group of people's life. So for example, the Catholic sacrament of confession is done as needed based on uh, committing sins. Another example of this might be exorcism, which you might never need to do unless there's a spirit bothering you. A fourth salient property of religion is sacrifice. This is giving up something of value as a sign of commitment to a person, cause, principle, or group. And by the way, this is one of the properties that New Age and spiritualism often lack. Although even there, there can be exceptions, partly because there have been religions formed out of the spiritualist and New Age movements. But the movements in general don't often have this notion of a person sacrificing something um for the sacred or you know some other commitment so there are several different types of religious sacrifices probably the one we think of first is a ritual sacrifice this is offering something valuable in a ritual directed to a sacred or supernatural being often for the purpose of getting something valuable in return from the sacred or supernatural being it could also be for the sake of purification of sin as in the case of the burnt offerings that were offered in the first temple and second temple in jerusalem in judaism um, another type of sacrifice though is just a renunciation giving up valuable things such as wealth food sex speaking physical comfort or autonomy that means freedom for the sake of a religious goal it could be salvation, it could be enlightenment, it could just be uh, spiritual improvement, things like that. And then a third type, which we might also classify as a sacrifice, although it overlaps with ethics, is taking on vows or codes of conduct that you agree to follow. It's a type of sacrifice of autonomy or freedom. You agree to give up certain types of actions or force yourself to perform certain types of actions as part of your commitment. And most religions have these sorts of um, sacrifices as well in terms of moral rules or legal codes that are binding on all members of the religion. One type of sacrifice, renunciation, can be practiced systematically, in which case it's often known as asceticism. This comes from a Greek word eschesis, which means exercise. Here it's being used in the sense of a spiritual exercise. You're renouncing something for the sake of purification, salvation, enlightenment, or some other spiritual goal. And when we use the word asceticism, as mentioned, it tends to be a sort of systematic, affects your whole life type of renunciation. Some examples of ascetics from world religions include traumanas in Hinduism, bhikkhus or monks in Buddhism, and monks and nuns in Christianity, uh, such as Orthodox and Catholic Christianity. In the picture is a Coptic Egyptian Christian monk, which uh, the Egyptian desert is basically where Christian monasticism originated in antiquity. There's also another couple of terms related to people who live an ascetic lifestyle. Eremeticism means being a hermit, practicing asceticism alone or mostly alone. And monasticism is practicing asceticism with a like-minded community of monks or nuns. 
A fifth salient characteristic of religion is morality. We can define this uh, as views about the good, virtue, and the right. This is generally how it's thought of in academic philosophy, for example. Good is something of moral value. Virtue is a good state of character, such as courage or honesty. And the right is a quality that applies to actions. It means an action that is worthy of being chosen. So religious morality is what makes them religious. There's at least two kinds, metaphysical and epistemological. Metaphysical is the one we most commonly think of. A metaphysical religious morality would be one in which moral truths are caused or created by the wish or command of sacred beings, such as the commandments ordered by God in Jewish, Christian, and Muslim belief. An epistemological religious morality is another possibility, though, where the moral truths are not created by God, but are just known by divine revelation or the revelation of other sacred beings. Some examples of religious codes of morality include the Ten Commandments in Judaism and Christianity, Five Pillars and Sharia in Islam, and the Dharma Shastras, uh, or collections on the Dharma or moral law in Hinduism. The picture is Gustave Doré's engraving of the prophet Moses receiving the commandments from God on top of Mount Sinai. A sixth salient property of religion is that it's generally social. This is another way in which it somewhat differs from New Age, which can also be practiced individually. Social is forming beliefs or performing behaviors in groups of people, so it's a very broad concept. But here are some more particular examples of the social aspects of religion. Uh, religious beliefs and practices are generally learned socially from other people rather than developed entirely individually. Also, a lot of religious rituals are performed by groups, including harmonized behaviors of group members, like all chanting, kneeling, praying, etc. at the same time. Also, a lot of religious sacrifice is done in public where other people can observe the sacrificial behavior. And finally, uh, public affirmation and social enforcement of religious morality. So the following of religious moral rules is often not left entirely up to individual whim or conscience, but rather can be encouraged or enforced strictly by other members of the religious community. A seventh salient property of religion is mystical. This is an experience of self-transcendence in which an individual goes beyond or alters their usual sense of self significantly, and they may experience a sense of union with the sacred or uh, supernatural being. Um, and there are many different types of mystical experiences, including some that would be interpreted as union of the soul with God, or perhaps possession by a ghost or spirit or particular deity. Um, and there could be other varieties as well. What they all have in common is a significant alteration in the usual sense of self, such as breakdown of the divide between self and world, or the sense of a union or communion or possession by another being. Mysticism could be defined as the systematic cultivation of mystical experience through mystical practices. And here are some examples of mystical practices, which are techniques for bringing about mystical experience chanting prayers or mantras, contemplative prayer, which means wordless, but usually directed toward God or some other sacred being or reality, meditation, psychedelic substances, uh, and rhythmic chanting, dancing, or singing with musical accompaniment. The latter is similar to chanting prayers or mantras, but it would have um, either musical instruments like drums or uh, chanting that's coordinated with physical movements. And these probably work through different mechanisms. A lot of them work through setting up a kind of mental rhythm where the mind continually refocuses on the same or similar object as with meditation on the breath, for example. And um, there's a lot of modern neuroscientific research that attempts to explain exactly what's going on. Psychedelics uh, would often work through a different mechanism, but what they all have in common is they produce this altered sense of self, this, uh, altered state of consciousness. An example of a famous mystical experience from within the Catholic tradition is the ecstasy of Saint Teresa, which she describes as this feeling of being penetrated by God's being as if by an arrow, which you can see wielded by an angel in this famous sculpture. An eighth salient property of religion is myth. 
We can define myth in this context as a story that focuses on expressing meaning and value rather than literal accuracy. Now, most religions believe their myths are literally true, but the main point of them is not just the literal accuracy, but they convey some other deeper meaning and value. Meaning can be unspoken, unspeakable, and can relate to intuition, feeling, emotion, and relationships, such as the meaning of a moving piece of music. And this is often related to the real significance of myths. So myths highlight and dramatize key issues and values in the life of an individual or of a society, such as life and death, the origin of humanity, the meaning or purpose of life, and the duties of a citizen or a spouse or a creature of God. Myth often serves as a bridge between the intellect and emotion. So they express an idea like the intellect, but they also often trigger an emotional or other response that's not entirely rational or verbal. Um, we can also understand myths in part by contrasting them with scientific theories. Scientific theories generally focus on testable predictions that you can compare to observations, empirical observations, typically that can be measured or quantified. Myths may do that a bit. They may actually have testable predictions in them, as with like a prophecy, but they generally focus on meaning and they try to orient people towards higher goals or values and towards performing certain types of actions. But myths can also be intended to explain natural or social phenomena. A famous example of an ancient Middle Eastern myth is that of Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Gilgamesh was an ancient Mesopotamian king. Enkidu was his friend and companion in arms. And one of the stories told about them is how they killed this creature from heaven, the bull of heaven, which you can see in the picture. It's similar, by the way, to how cherubim or cherubs are sometimes described in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and what emerged out of their slaying this uh, bull of heaven was that they were eventually cursed by the gods because Enkidu hurled up the thigh bone of the bull of heaven in kind of contempt towards heaven. And that's when the king of heaven cursed him to death. He died and Gilgamesh was distraught and that kind of set him off on his quest for an understanding of death and immortality. And a ninth salient characteristic of religion is symbol. Symbol is using one thing to suggest or express another meaning. Symbols communicate meaning, um, and like myths, they often serve to unite intellect and emotions. Um, they also often integrate personal and social dimensions of religion. Uh, for example, the uh, story of the temptation and fall of man of Adam and Eve in the garden uh, being tempted by the serpent um, it's a myth, but it also has a lot of symbol in it, such as the tree, the fruit, the serpent, etc. Um, and in that myth, arguably, the symbols both um, relate to individual or personal aspects of religion, such as the reality of sin, but also social aspects, such as the condition of humanity in general, or why human societies need to be structured certain ways. But Symbols are not the only thing that communicate meaning. I mean, signs in general do that. So what's the difference? Um, signs in general, such as words, tend to be more arbitrary, whereas symbols are more intimately involved with that which they refer. A symbol participates in what it symbolizes. For example, a kiss, symbolic greeting, brings two people in physical contact with each other. Um, the serpent, as a symbol of temptation, because serpents are often venomous, um, that symbolizes the danger of temptation. Religious symbols often express sacred values. Examples include the cross of Christ, the Muslim Quran, the bull of Shiva, and an image of the seated Buddha under the tree of enlightenment. So these symbols are ones that adherents of the religion would regard as sacred and wouldn't want to defile, profane, or trade off for anything of lesser value. And if they were attacked, if the symbols are attacked, people would usually defend them with great vehemence. Sacred symbols are identified with by the faithful who take offense if the symbol is attacked, in other words. Symbols also provide a focal point of faith and action. For example, in the ceremony of the Eucharist in Christianity or the, the mass or Holy Communion, 
um, the bread and wine, even if it's regarded as literally the body and blood of Jesus, as it is in Catholic and Orthodox Christianity, it's also doing symbolic work um, because it's probably significant that God is regarded as literally present in something that is food and drink, that is nourishing. So there's at least a partially symbolic component or aspect or dimension to it, even though it also has literal meaning. So that's why it counts as a symbol, even if people believe in the real presence of God in the Eucharist. But also notice how that example, the Eucharist is the focal point of the whole uh, communion ceremony and the uh, going to church, participating in this collective or joint ritual. Um, and also the Eucharist is kind of focal for a lot of Christians because it represents union of the individual soul with God, uh, worshiping God, uh, Jesus' sacrifice, et cetera, et cetera. And this is by no means unique to Christianity. Other religions have symbols that are also focal and that help unite fellow believers into a community. So uh, here is some additional terminology, which is very helpful in studying religion. The word sect refers to a subdivision of a religion with distinctive doctrines and practices. The word denomination can also be uh, similar. Sometimes denomination implies a larger sect or a larger subdivision of a religion. But the term denomination originated in the various forms of Protestant Christianity. So sometimes um, it mainly implies the context of Protestantism and may be a bit misleading or just not typically used in reference to subdivisions of other religions. But the term sect is in general use. Here are some examples of sects. The Jehovah's Witnesses are a sect of Christianity. Now, one of their distinctive doctrines is they deny the doctrine of the Trinity which is one believed in by most other Christians who follow the Nicene Creed. Um, and that applies to uh, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox Christians. They believe that God has three persons, but one being. That's the Trinity doctrine, but Jehovah's Witnesses deny that. Um, Shia in Islam, the name literally means sect. This is a very large proportion of uh, Muslims. Basically, all Muslims that aren't Sunni, for the most part, are Shia. And their, some of their particular doctrines are they think uh, relatives of the Prophet Muhammad are the ones that should have the authority in leading the Muslim uh, community or Ummah. Uh, Vira Shaiva, sect of Hinduism. This one is so distinct that some people regard it as not even Hindu. They uh, worship the god Shiva just like many other Hindus, but unlike most other Hindus, they are monotheistic. And they also... Um, deny or at least downplay the authority of the caste of Brahmins or priests. Uh, another example of a sect from Buddhism is Rinzai Zen. Zen is the meditation school of Mahayana Buddhism that focuses on meditation practice as being key for the individual to attain enlightenment. Rinzai Zen in particular focuses on koan or meditating on short stories of an interaction between a Zen master and student that are often paradoxical or resist rational interpretation, but are believed to contain, at least symbolically, deep truths that will help you attain enlightenment if you meditate upon them. The word cult is also useful in the study of religion, but it's often confused because it has two entirely distinct meanings. So it is ambiguous. It's still useful as long as you just make clear which of the two meanings you have in mind. The first meaning is just an organized pattern of worshiping or honoring a sacred being or potentially a non-sacred supernatural being of another kind, but usually they're sacred. So this sense of the word cult is not negative at all. It's neutral or even positive. Example include the cult of Mary and the cult of saints in Catholic, Orthodox, and Anglican Christianity. The second meaning of the word cult is negative. It means a sect or a religion characterized by an attempt to manipulate, exploit, or abuse its members. So an example is Jim Jones's People's Temple, which uh, Jim Jones was a Christian pastor who created um, a church that was kind of influenced a bit by the 1960s counterculture. He portrayed himself as arguing for racial justice and uniting blacks, whites, and others in one religion, but he ended up 
convincing a lot of his followers to commit suicide by drinking poison Kool-Aid after removing them uh, to South America in a very remote area. So oftentimes cults will do that to try to get more control over people. They will physically or socially separate them from um, non-members of the cult. Another example is Om Shinrikyo, a Japanese cult which orchestrated a terrorist attack on the Tokyo subway system in the 1990s using a poison gas called sarin. Section 1.3, why are humans religious? So we know that religion exists. We know that humans are religious, but it could be a deep puzzle as to why religion exists in the first place. Let's consider a few reasons why religion is puzzling. Religiosity is nearly universal among human cultures. That's actually no longer the case uh, with the secularization we see with modernity, but the rise of secularization in modern societies is pretty recent, happening within the last 50 to 100 years. Uh, other than that, throughout most of human history, almost every society was religious. But what's interesting is that the particular religions did vary pretty significantly as to their beliefs and practices. Uh, a second reason why religion is puzzling is that religious beliefs and practices often seem absurd or counterintuitive to outsiders, but make perfect sense to insiders. So it's almost as if some of those religious beliefs and practices are by design difficult to comprehend or accept, even though they are accepted by members of the religion. An example is the doctrine of the Trinity shared by most Christians. It seems weird, at least on first glance, to describe God as one being, but having three separate persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Usually we think of one person as one being. A third reason why religion is puzzling is that religion involves costly behaviors with no obvious or tangible benefit, such as building churches and temples, sacrificing a lot of the uh, value a lot of the wealth or income of individuals and communities. Practicing fasting and renunciation, uh, giving up food and other valuable things, following moral rules, and tithing income to a church. So it's not only believing weird or counterintuitive things, but paying quite a price to do so. There are a variety of types of explanations for religion. We're going to go through several of the types one by one. We'll start with supernatural explanations. These try to explain religion by saying it was deliberately created or caused by God, God, spirits, or other supernatural beings. An example, God inspired Abraham and the other prophets of the Bible so that people could know God and worship him. This could be true, but it doesn't seem to explain why there are other religions that have contradictory beliefs and practices. And you could make a similar critique of other religions' supernatural explanations for their own existence. A second type of explanation is psychological. These explain religion in one of two ways, either by pointing to basic human psychological drives or motives or needs, or to basic human uh, cognitive structures, or they could do both. A famous example is Sigmund Freud, an early psychologist, his view that religion is a coping mechanism to deal with anxiety or trauma. Now this simplifies Freud's view significantly, but it's accurate enough for the purpose of illustration. Um, a limitation that may be faced by psychological explanations is that it's often difficult for them to explain all of religious behavior, which can be quite diverse with their preferred mode of explanation. For example, in the case of Freud, his theory has difficulty explaining why people would sacrifice themselves or their resources for their religion. Um, if it's a coping mechanism, how is sacrificing your life being a martyr, for example, for Christianity or Islam, a coping mechanism to deal with anxiety? Uh, also, it seems because it's an individualistic explanation, it has difficulty accounting for the social dimension of religion. And this is something that would be a limitation both of the cognitive structure based psychological explanations and the motive based psychological explanations. A, a word of warning with all of these uh, explanations that we're gonna go through, by critiquing them, I'm not implying that we can definitively prove that quickly that the explanation doesn't work. 
Uh, in order to do that, you'd have to do a much more systematic discussion. I'm just trying to give you a flavor of both the strengths and some of the characteristic weaknesses of these various types of explanation. A third general type of explanation we could call social, sociological, or even socioeconomic. These attempt to explain religion by pointing to the actions, motives, and interests of social classes or other social institutions. So an example is Karl Marx, who regarded religion as used by capitalists to get people to accept material inequality and exploitation by giving them false hope or promise of a happy afterlife. Um, a limitation is that they might not be able to explain all of religious behavior, again, similar to the psychological explanations. To use Marxist theory as an example, it could potentially explain uh, religion in inegalitarian societies, but even very egalitarian human hunter-gatherer societies still have religion, usually in the form of animism or belief in nature spirits. So there's at least something else going on there that Marxist theory fails to capture. A fourth type of explanation we could call biological evolutionary. These go back to Darwin, at least. Um, they argue that religion is caused by biological evolution, mainly through a force of natural selection. There's two main versions of this. One regards religion as functional, uh, in other words, as being an adaptation that helps individual, individuals or groups of humans survive and reproduce. An example of that is by the evolutionary biologist David Sloan Wilson in his book, Darwin's Cathedral. Uh, but there's also a view that religion is caused by biological evolution, but is not itself an adaptation, but rather just a byproduct of other adaptations of humans. An example of this is Scott Atran, who argued that religion is a byproduct of humans' evolved tendency to explain things in terms of human-like agents, like gods and spirits. With regard to Atran, he has a book called Faces in the Clouds, that makes this argument. Although I think he may have updated his view since he wrote that book, since I've also seen him advocate in terms of the next explanation of religion, cultural evolution. Some general limitations of the biological evolutionary explanations, these are often difficult to prove or test, which is not the same as saying that they're false, just that it may be hard to verify because we can't do experiments easily on human evolution. Also, it's a bit of a mystery how particular religious beliefs and behaviors would be heritable. Probably they're not because those are learned as part of a culture. However, the general tendency and ability to learn and practice a religion might indeed be biologically based and thus heritable. Finally, uh, many of the adaptationist views of religion rely on the concept of group selection, which I happen to think is probably real, but is very controversial within evolutionary biology. A fifth and final type of explanation for religion is the cultural evolutionary. These are more recent. It argues that religion helps cultures, but not biological organisms per se, survive and reproduce. If you think about a culture, they include things like language or religion or other customs, and they can be transmitted to other human organisms without the transmission of genes. Hopefully that helps illustrate the difference between cultural and biological evolution. Um, some recent examples of this are the evolutionary anthropologist Joseph Henrich and uh, the social scientist Ara Norenzayan, who wrote a book called Big Gods, How Religion Transformed Cooperation and Conflict. I happen to think that this is a very promising explanation of religion, but like the biological evolutionary explanation, it's difficult to test because we can't run experiments on it. We can still gather data from observational studies of cultures and the like, but it can be difficult to have decisive tests. Also, because this is a relatively new theoretical framework, only emerging in the last decade or two, it definitely needs more analysis and critique before we just accept it. Section 1.4, we're going to go over now the main types of religion. We're going to give what's called a typology or a system for classifying things of a given kind, in this case religion, into smaller subcategories or types. An example would be a biological taxonomy of species. Now there's going to be some both advantages but also limitations of our typology of religion. 
one thing to keep in mind is even though I'm going to go through several different general types of religion, it's possible for an individual religion to only partially belong to one of those types. Like for example, some religions may have some features of animism or belief in many spirits without having others. It's also very possible for religions to belong to multiple types. So this typology is not meant to be exclusivist. The advantages of coming up with a typology of religion, howsoever approximate, are that we can quickly use these types to identify some of the salient properties of a particular religion, if we know its general type. We can also use these types to notice patterns of resemblance and difference between various religions that we study. Uh, let's begin with animism. This is religion based, based on belief in spirits, such as nature spirits, ancestor spirits, and spirits of the dead in general. This is the oldest type of human religion. So as far as we know, it's as old as humanity and thus dates back to the Paleolithic period. So this ended around 10,000 BC, but goes back hundreds of thousands of years. Um, animism is present in many hunter forager societies. An example of modern animism is the Tuvan shamanism. We can see here uh, a Tuvan fire uh, or shaman performing a fire seance. So the Tuvans also uh, practice Vajrayana Buddhism, but they often combine it with their form of animism. So let's talk about this word spirit. What does it mean? You can define a spirit as a immaterial or non-material sentient or conscious being. So they're like humans in that they're sentient or conscious, but they lack a physical body or at least an ordinary physical body. Animism generally uh, believes in a variety of spirits and they can either be helpful or harmful. Now, unfriendly or harmful spirits are often regarded as the source of diseases or bad luck, misfortune, or even famines or uh, plagues, things like that. Friendly or helpful spirits might be used to cure disease, to bring good fortune and abundance, or to get important information. In animism, uh, unlike in some other later religions, the same spirits can often be either friendly or unfriendly, depending on how they're treated or a person or community's relationship to them. And that's different from the notion, for example, of Christianity and Islam, which makes a sharp contrast between angels and demons. Um, oftentimes in animism, the same spirit can be either friendly or unfriendly, just depending on your relationship to them. I'm using this picture of fairies or nymphs uh, by the 18th century English artist William Blake just as an example of the persistence of animism in European belief and folklore. Even after Europeans converted to Christianity, you could look at belief in fairies or spirits of nature as kind of like a remnant of the early animistic religions. A shaman is a person who acts as an intermediary between humans and the spirit world. They could also be called medicine man, spirit medium, or witch doctor. The word spirit medium suggests a person who is able to be possessed by or at least communicate directly with spirits. Shamans often go on spirit journeys or have visions or trances where they communicate or interact with spirits. Not all animistic religions have shamans, but many do. Uh, shamans are also present in or mixed with other religions, such as in Tibetan Buddhism, Taoism, and Korean Buddhism. In the picture is a Tibetan shaman. You can see some Buddhist imagery on his headdress, as well as imagery that's rooted in Tibetan animism specifically. These are some examples of animist rituals. These are by no means limited to animist religions. You often see them in all types of religion but they show you how animism um, has a lot of the same functions performed by other types of religion. So divination rituals are generally involving contact with spirits to gain information. It could be to get advice on the best course of action, or it could even be to discover lost or hidden information that would be useful to someone. Healing ritual uh, often involves placating, or driving away unfriendly spirits or calling upon friendly spirits to help. Um, oftentimes in uh, pre-modern societies, disease is just attributed to unfriendly spirits. Uh, you can even see an example of this 
in the Christian Gospels where Jesus cures a lot of people of physical ailments by driving out demons. So that arguably is an animistic aspect of Christianity. Um, a hunting ritual would generally be geared around ensuring the success of the hunt. You see similar types of rituals where there's high stakes but high uncertainty or high risk activities like going out in a fishing vessel into the sea to try to get fish. You may come home with nothing. You may get lost in a storm. Bad things can happen. Um, and so you want to perform the ritual to try to ensure success. Uh, this can also be used uh, when someone is starting a business, especially in the modern uh, context. Coming of age rituals are to mark off the entry into adulthood. That's often done both male and female initiations. And death rituals, a near human universal, accompany the disposal of a deceased person's mortal remains. In the picture is a traditional healer from the Bamasaba people of Uganda. There are still animistic religions in Sub-Saharan Africa, although they're being rapidly replaced by Christianity and Islam. A second general type of religion we might call Neolithic, just because it originated historically in the Neolithic period. This is characterized by the continued use of stone tools, but with the early development of farming, including both domestication of plants like wheat and animals like cows. And this began around 10,000 BC. So there's aspects of Neolithic religion though that carry over into the later types of religions. Another thing to keep in mind, I'm portraying these types of religions as if they emerge in strict chronological order. It's not entirely true. There's a general truth to that, however. So some people excessively emphasize, this was especially true of traditional uh, scholarship, the chronological order of the religious typology as if to imply that because animistic religions are the oldest, they're necessarily outmoded. That is a bit prejudicial or probably assumes too much. But on the other hand, nowadays we mainly have the opposite problem of people wanting to deny any sort of chronological progression or historical evolution in human religion when actually we tend to see societies going through these religions in a particular order. For example, as far as I know, um, there's no ancient society that started out monotheistic and then became animistic. That sort of thing might happen occasionally, but if so, it's the exception, not the norm. Uh, so it is useful to have a bit of a chronological perspective as well, or uh, evolutionary perspective of these types without insisting on it as an absolute. So Neolithic religion in general focuses on worshiping gods associated with fertility farming, death, war, and cosmic cycles. Those cosmic cycles are going to be relevant to the new modes of economic uh, food production that came along with domestication of plants and animals. Neolithic religion tends to be polytheistic rather than animistic or monotheistic. That means they believe in many gods rather than uh, many nature spirits or just one god. Um, and it's a customary religion, which means that it's not missionary. They don't generally try to spread their religion to other cultures and not based on written scriptures. Um, we also could have just called this religion customary religion, or we could regard customary religion as another type, general type, but it intersects with a lot of the other types of religion, like animism, Neolithic uh, religion. Both of those are customary, for example. So Neolithic religion is often associated with the um, creation of stone monumental structures. These were generally built as places for religious rituals. In fact, the oldest monumental stone structure built by humans that's known, Gebekli Tepe, uh, which is in modern Turkey, is a religious structure. And it's corresponding to the very earliest beginnings of the Neolithic era when uh, humans were just starting to domesticate some of the wild growing species of wheat in that part of the Middle East. Another thing you see with Neolithic religion is the use of axis mundi or symbolic centers of the world. So these are usually structures, could be pyramids, could be um, pillars or other um, structures that have verticality that are being used as symbolic centers of the world and typically a kind of nexus that connects the earth, the human world, with either the underworld or the sky or heaven or both. An example of that is the Newgrange site in Ireland. I believe this is a Neolithic tomb, 
but because of its uh, mound-like structure, it's often used as an example of an axis mundi. So a lot of the tombs of ancient kings or rulers, that was part of their function to connect the heaven, the earth, and the underworld. By the way, you'll notice the date around 3200 BC. Um, the British Isles at that time still had a Neolithic culture. Um, they didn't have a lot of bronze metallurgy or large towns, whereas in other parts of the world, such as in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, they were already into the Bronze Age and they were developing um, cities as well as bronze tools and weapons. So when we talk about Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and so on, it's partially a reference to a stage of material culture development, not just a period of time that was present all throughout the human civilization or human world. Cosmic cycles are an important part of Neolithic religions because of their relevance to farming. Cosmic cycles are repeating patterns of phenomena in nature, such as movements of the sun, moon, planets, and stars. You get the development of ancient forms of astronomy or astrology. This is the pre-scientific study of celestial phenomena. This is often important to help time things like planting and harvesting, uh, as well as timing when you want to um, feed uh, your herd, all the members of your herd of animals, and when you might want to butcher some of them, for example, with the approach of winter when there's going to be less feed available for them. So Stonehenge, a very famous uh, megalithic site in England from the uh, British Neolithic period, was built from around 3000 to 2000 BC, somewhere in that general range. And there are aspects of the sighting of the stones that reflect astrological or pre-scientific astronomical knowledge. So Neolithic religions often have gods in them, not just spirits. There's no absolute distinction between a god and spirit, but in general, a god is like a spirit, but has greater power and is responsible for controlling a wider swath of nature or of the cosmos. Spirits are often associated with a particular location, for example, the spirit of a particular mountain or a particular tree or a particular spring or well or of a particular ancestor, whereas gods can control a larger swath of nature like all the sky, the earth, the sea, the sun, the moon, grain, cattle, weather, or war. Examples of gods from ancient religions include Zeus, Thor, and Indra, all of whom were gods of thunder and also were kings of their pantheon of gods. Thor was later replaced by Odin as the king of the Norse or North Germanic gods, but in the ancient form of the religion, he was actually uh, the ruler or king of the gods. So gods can be depicted in different ways. The two most common are anthropomorphic and theriomorphic. Anthropomorphic means depicted as a human, having a human form or shape. Theriomorphic means being depicted as all or partly animal. Um, so gods may also just be associated with or symbolized by animals. An example of that is the god Shiva from Hinduism, who's depicted usually as a human, but is associated with the bull Nandi. Um, cats are often associated with goddesses or vice versa, such as the ancient Egyptian cat goddess Bast, the goddess Durga in Hinduism, who's associated with the tiger, and Shi Wang Mu, the Chinese folk religion or Taoist goddess of the Western paradise, who's also associated with the tiger. And gods are often associated with the bull, such as Apis from ancient Egyptian religion, El from Canaanite religion, and the aforementioned Shiva from Hinduism. A third type of religion is priestly religion. You could also call it temple religion because it's usually associated with temples or permanent uh, shrines or high places. But there were some forms of the religion such as that practiced by some of the nomadic uh, Central Asian and European steppe peoples um, like the Proto-Indo-Europeans and their successors like the Scythians and Aryans that because they were nomadic didn't build fixed structures. And so I think the word priestly religion is probably more appropriate. So this began around 3000 BC, around the same period as the development of Bronze Age metallurgy and the building of cities or larger towns. Um, and it focuses on the worship of gods by specially trained priests. 
These are like shamans in that they're intermediaries between um, people and the gods, but they often worship at designated sacred structures like temples, altars, or high places. Priestly religion tends to be polytheistic and customary. And also the way that the priest functions in society is sometimes a little bit different, at least on the margin from shamans. So priests are even more likely to do this as their full-time occupation. There also can be whole classes or castes of the society that are dedicated to being priests. So we can define a priest as a ritual specialist who serves as an intermediary between gods and other people, and they're often devoted to particular gods. For example, the Levites were the tribe of priests in ancient Jewish religion, uh, which was focused on worshiping at the temple in Jerusalem. You can see a modern artist reconstruction of the first temple or the one built by Solomon uh, in the slide on the right. So uh, outside of the temple building is a high place where burnt offerings would be given to God. And then inside the temple, um, there's an inner sanctum called the Holy of Holies where God was believed to dwell. Now, Judaism is kind of an exception because it developed a form of monotheism in the early Iron Age, so probably around 1000 BC or after. But most of the priestly religions, both of the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, were polytheistic or believed in many gods. Um, there is a whole group of peoples called Indo-European who speak different languages that descend from a common linguistic ancestor. The discovery of the relation between the Indo-European languages was actually the beginning of modern linguistics, when some European scholars noticed similarities between the Indian language, Sanskrit, used for the oldest Hindu scriptures, the Veda, and ancient European languages like Greek and Latin. But uh, modern theory says that the Indo-European languages um, were all derived from a language called Proto-Indo-European by scholars. We don't really know what the people who spoke this language called themselves or their language, but the scholarly consensus is that it was spoken by people on the Eurasian steppe, so including parts of what are now Ukraine, the Russian Federation and Kazakhstan. You can see the dark green area on the map. So this is parts of Eura and Central Asia. And these were a nomadic people who had um, domesticated horses. They invented or adopted the wheel. So they were able to ride around the steppe and feed off of their herds of horses and other um, domesticated animals. So it appears because uh, of later um, developments in the cultures that spoke languages derived from Proto-Indo-European, that the Proto-Indo-Europeans may have had three main social classes, warriors, priests, and everyone else. Um, and we do see from a lot of the later people who spoke Indo-European languages that they had a class of priests, not all of them, but many of them. Um, one of the most famous examples is the Aryans, specifically the Indo-Aryans, or a group of Aryans who migrated to India from Central Asia. Their caste of priests is known as Brahmins, and these are still the priests of modern Hinduism. So Hinduism is probably one of the oldest world religions that has preserved continuity. Um, they go back at least to 1500 BC, which is the approximate date of the older parts of the Veda. So that's at least 3,500 years of continuity in that religion. Other ancient peoples uh, like the Celts who spoke Indo-European languages, they had a class of, Druids called, uh, class of priests called the Druids. Like the Brahmins, the Druids did not write down most of their teachings, but memorize them. Although in later centuries, eventually the Brahmins did write down the Veda. And in ancient Persian society, this is another um, Indo-European culture, and particularly the Persians, their language was related to that of the Indo-Aryans. The some of the Aryans migrated to India, uh, where their language became Sanskrit, and um, other Aryans migrated to Persia, the modern nation of Iran, which is actually named after the Aryans, where their language became Persian and modern Farsi. But in antiquity, there was a class or tribe of the Persians known as the Magi in the West, who were their main group of priests. 
A fourth type of religion is prophetic religion. This begins around 1000 BC or the early Iron Age. Uh, if we consider ancient Judaism uh, and Zoroastrianism or Persian religion as early examples of this type. A prophet is a person who speaks on behalf of or receives revelation from a God, from God or a God. So prophetic religion is usually based on distinctive teachings attributed to a specific prophet or lineage of prophets. Um, this is actually different from customary religions like um, Neolithic religion or earlier priestly religions, which tended to not have a specific prophet attributed as the source of the teachings. You might be wondering how this could be. A good analogy with this is languages. Languages like English or Spanish or Chinese are just part of the culture. They are not attributed to a specific inventor or if they are, the attribution is legendary. So customary religions are like that. They're just passed down with the rest of the culture. But prophets are named individuals who are religious innovators. They're often regarded as divinely inspired, but regardless, they introduce new doctrines and new practices to the religion. So they're modifying the customary religion. An example is the ancient Jewish prophet Moses, who received a revelation from God on Mount Sinai. Zarathustra is a famous ancient prophet. His dates are unknown, but if he was a real person, he probably lived before 500 BC, and he was a reformer of the ancient Persian religion. The original version of the Persian religion was probably more similar to the earliest form of Hinduism, insofar as both the ancient Persians and the ancient Indians were Aryans. However, um, it gradually evolved apart as the two Aryans were separated geographically and historically. And in particular, Zarathustra or Zoroaster in the Greek created a reform which modified the theology and other beliefs of the ancient Persian religion. So Zarathustra taught a form of monotheism. There was only one true God whom he called Ahura Mazda, although there were other divine beings uh, that were created by God who were worshipped by ancient Zoroastrians. These are similar to angels in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Zarathustra was also a dualist who taught that there were two main forces or powers in the world. In addition to the good god, Ahura Mazda, there was an evil being known as Angra Mainyu who opposed Ahura Mazda. And so he interpreted history as a long fight or battle between these two forces, and every human had to choose one or the other. But he predicted that eventually Ahura Mazda would triumph, and there would be a day of judgment in which all human souls will be judged by God, Ahura Mazda, and face punishment or reward based on their thoughts, words, and deeds. Another example of prophetic religion is the uh, group of Abrahamic religions. These are often lumped together because they all stem from a line of prophets beginning with Abraham. Um, however, they have very different theologies and beliefs as well. So it's both revealing but also potentially um, misleading to classify them all together. Uh, but Judaism is uh, the most ancient form of these religions, and the Jewish prophets basically end with um, the prophetic books of the Hebrew Bible, like the book of Isaiah, for example. But it's a very long line of prophets, including Abraham, Moses, and Elijah are three of the very important figures, and Isaiah is one of the more important later prophets. Christianity is an outgrowth of Judaism that accepts all of the Jewish lineage of prophets, but adds Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, anointed one of God, and the Son of God, and of God himself, according to most Christians. So that's a sharp distinction from um, Jews. And then Islam um, does accept the prophets of Judaism and accepts Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth as a prophet and even as the Messiah, but does not regard Jesus as God or the Son of God. And also, Islam adds Muhammad as the seal of the prophets or the last and greatest of the prophets. 
A fifth type of religion is mystery religion. This type originated around 500 BC, i.e. in the later Iron Age. Mystery religions um, have core teachings and rituals that are kept secret from outsiders and revealed only to initiates, those who have gone through some sort of process or procedure in which they usually have to go through some trials or sacrifices before becoming approved to join the religion. And usually the core teachings and rituals that are secret are related to special blessings or salvation, which can be attained in this life or in the next. The teachings of mystery religion can be called esoteric, which means secret or hidden, revealed only to the few, unlike exoteric, which means public. Some examples of mystery religions are the Eleusinian mysteries of ancient, Gre uh, ancient Greece, these involve teachings that we're supposed to give a blessed afterlife. So they're about death and immortality. Um, the picture on the right shows Triptolemus receiving wheat from Demeter, the Greek goddess of grain, and blessings from Persephone, the daughter of Demeter, who was also associated with death and the underworld because she was kidnapped and forced to marry Hades, the god of the dead. So because Demeter was associated with fertility, and Persephone was associated with both death and fertility, they became fitting uh, symbols or fitting divine beings in a religion that's connected with death and the afterlife. There are esoteric sects of many religions, um, such as the tantric forms of Hinduism and Buddhism. Tantric Buddhism is also called Vajrayana. And there are esoteric forms of Christianity, such as the so-called Gnostic sects of antiquity, most of which had a belief not only of salvific knowledge or gnosis, but they kept this secret or hidden from non-initiates. A sixth type of religion is scriptural. This emerged around the first century AD. Arguably, it has earlier precedents. So for example, the scripture of the Veda in Hinduism is focal and salient and normative for all Hindus. However, the scriptural religions per se place supreme authority in the sacred texts as opposed to uh, a class of priests to interpret the text. Um, and that's what makes them distinctive. Uh, so examples of scriptural religions are arguably rabbinic Judaism, um, which started in the Pharisee movement, a sect of ancient Judaism that focused on studying the Torah or the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. And they regarded the Tanakh as more authoritative than the priests or Levites who performed rituals at the temple in Jerusalem. So that's what separated them from the Sadducees and other sects of ancient Jews. After the destruction of the second temple of Judaism in the first century AD by the Romans, rabbinic Judaism became the dominant form of Judaism. So you could look at modern Judaism as primarily a scriptural religion. Christianity um, is another example because most Christians placed a uh, supreme authority of doctrine in uh, the Hebrew Bible and the Christian New Testament, which includes the gospels, the letters, and the revelation of John. And in Islam, uh, Muslims place, place supreme authority upon the revelations to the Prophet Muhammad as recorded in the Quran. A seventh type of religion is missionary religion. This one also has fuzzy beginnings depending upon how you count it. 500 BC is a good approximation because this is around the time that rival sects started to compete for followers in the Ganges River Valley in ancient India. And these were some of the early, uh, earlier missionary religions. Missionary religions actively seek to gain converts by sending representatives to teach other individuals, societies, or cultures about their religion. And that's different from most customary religions. By analogy, just as most cultures didn't deliberately try to spread their language to other societies or cultures, most customary religions didn't seek to export themselves or convert others to worshiping their gods or practicing their customs. Examples of missionary religions include Buddhism, also Jainism, which emerged around the same time in ancient India, Christianity, and Islam. 
there's also some religions that are not in general missionary, like Judaism and Hinduism, but which have particular sects that are missionary. Example is the Lubavitch Chabad within Judaism and the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, Isk Khan, or nicknamed the Hare Krishnas from Hinduism. Another example of a highly missionary sect uh, of Christianity is the Latter-day Saints or Mormons. An eighth type of religion is fundamentalism. This is the most recent type that emerged only in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It emerged as a reaction against modernity, such as modern science, industrialization, and certain modern moral, political, and cultural ideas and movements. Fundamentalists seek to return to the perceived original or pure form of a religion, and they often reject certain aspects of modern society, culture, or scientific ideology in order to do so. So fundamentalism emerged first among Christians, partly as a reaction against certain modern sciences like geology, evolutionary biology, and modern cosmology based on astronomy and astrophysics, because a lot of these uh, sciences conflicted with biblical accounts of creation and the structure of the universe. Also, fundamentalists rejected the beginnings of feminism and modern sexual and social morality, um, such as more acceptance of homosexuality. Fundamentalists regard these as conflicting with the patriarchal and traditional family values or just other traditional moral codes that are taught by their religions. The name fundamentalism comes from a series of tracts called the Fundamentals, which were published in the United States from the years 1910 and following. Fundamentalist views are various. They often advocate a literal interpretation of their scriptures and traditional moral and family values. Um, they often reject not all of science, but just those specific scientific discoveries that conflict with their religion's account of creation. So they often deny the modern biological theory of evolution, for example. They may reject certain aspects of popular culture that they may regard as evil, demonic, occult, or against their religion. Like uh, many Christian fundamentalists uh, think of Harry Potter as demonic because of the magic uh, depicted in those fantasy novels and films. Um, they also will reject certain modern values uh, like gay rights uh, or transgender rights. Um, and they can even reject aspects of their own religious tradition that they regard as conflicting with their perceived version of the original or pure form of religion. So many Christian fundamentalists um, reject the Christian festivals of Christmas and Easter, for example. Uh, some examples of fundamentalism, uh, Christian, Muslim, and even Buddhism has at least one fundamentalist sect, the Thai forest tradition. We often associate fundamentalism with violence or extremism. Um, that's not always the case. The Thai forest tradition is fundamentalist in the sense that it rejects a lot of aspects of traditional Thai Buddhism and even aspects of Theravada Buddhism and focuses on their attempt to reconstruct the original teaching of the Buddha as found in the Pali Canon, the oldest complete set of Buddhist scriptures. But not all Thai forest tradition monks or teachers are fundamentalists in the sense of being violent or politically involved, um, but it does kind of vary. So fundamentalism is also often associated or linked to religious nationalism. Um, religious nationalism links religion with national identity. And even though it's often referred to as fundamentalist, it's not necessarily the same thing. De facto, there's often a lot of overlap between fundamentalists and religious nationalists, but they are at least conceptually and doctrinally distinct. Some examples of religious nationalism include the various types of Islamism or political Islam, the Hindutva or Hinduness movement in modern India, which connects Indian national identity with the Hindu religion. And a Buddhist variety of this is the 969 movement in Burma or Myanmar, which regards being a Buddhist as part of Burmese ethnic identity. And people in this movement have even encouraged the government using uh, violence 
to get rid of non-Buddhists from Burma. Uh, an important thinker in political Islam was the Egyptian Sayyid Qutb. And finally, part 1.5, we're going to give a general typology of some of the main types of religious beliefs. So many of the types of religious beliefs fall under the philosophical category of metaphysics, which means theories about the fundamental nature of reality. This is not a complete list, but these are some of the common types of beliefs many religions have. Theology or theory of God or the gods, or we might add other supernatural beings. Cosmology, a theory of the nature or structure of the universe. Cosmogony, a theory of the beginning or origin of the universe. Psychology, this is in the philosophical sense, not in the modern scientific sense, which is a theory of the nature of the soul, mind, or self. Soteriology, which is a theory of salvation or enlightenment. And eschatology, which is a theory either of the afterlife or sometimes the end of the world. So we're going to explain each of these types of religious belief in a bit more detail, starting with number one, theology. Theology is a theory of the nature of God, the gods, or other supernatural beings. These are some examples of general types of theology. Animism, belief in many spirits, such as spirits of nature, spirits of the dead, and ancestor spirits in particular. Polytheism is belief in many gods. Monotheism is belief that there's only one god or one supreme god. Pantheism is the belief that God is the natural world or universe. This is not a very common view historically among most religions, but it is an increasingly popular one in the last few centuries. Uh, first argued for uh, significantly by the Dutch Jewish philosopher Baruch Spinoza in the 17th century. Panentheism is a variety of pantheism, which says that God includes the natural world, but also transcends it. Atheism is the view that there is no God, not very common among religions. Most religions believe either in some type of God or gods or supernatural beings. Uh, Buddhism, for example, even though it doesn't generally regard God or gods as the instrument of salvation, traditionally, most Buddhists were polytheistic. Agnosticism is the belief it's not known whether there's a God. Technically, this is not a metaphysical theory, but rather an epistemological or theory of knowledge view, but it's still worth mentioning in the context of theology. There's also the term used by many scholars of religion, non-theistic or non-theistic religion. This means that belief in God or gods does not play a central role in the religion. Depending upon how you interpret it, you could interpret uh, some even traditional forms of Buddhism as non-theistic, because while they believe in gods and goddesses and spirits, the main beings that are worshipped and regarded as sacred are Buddhas, Arhants, and other enlightened beings, some of which can be gods, but most of which were human. Um, and there's some modern forms of Buddhism, generally characterized as Buddhist modernism by religious studies scholars, that deny the existence of gods or supernatural beings in general. Jupiter, shown in the slide, is just an example of a god, king of the gods in ancient Roman religion. There's also the term avatar, which means a god or other supernatural being dwelling in a human body. They can also be referred to as incarnations. The word avatar comes from Sanskrit. In Hinduism, there's a belief that many gods have avatars, and they can have multiple avatars. Uh, most famous examples are Krishna and Rama, who most Hindus regard as avatars of Vishnu, uh, one of the main Hindu gods. Christianity believes that Jesus is the incarnation, or you might say the avatar of God, although the difference between the Christian view and that of Indian religions like Hinduism is that Christians only believe in one God and they just believe in one unique incarnation. Buddhism um, doesn't worship um, God or gods as their primary focus. However, many Buddhists do believe that Buddhas 
can and also bodhisattvas or beings that are on the path to becoming a buddha can choose to manifest or incarnate in particular forms and so they also believe in avatars such as budai who in chinese and east asian buddhism he's often depicted as a fat and jolly uh, buddhist monk he's uh, generally regarded as an avatar of maitreya buddha whom Buddhists believe will be the next Buddha of our world in the next age. There are non-anthropomorphic and impersonal views of God or the sacred. Non-anthropomorphic means that God lacks a human shape or form. Um, for example, in ancient Judaism, although God was sometimes described in anthropomorphic ways, there was also a teaching that God transcends uh, human form. Notably, Christians, even though they descend from ancient Judaism, they do believe that God has a human form, although only in the person of Jesus Christ, one of the three persons of the Trinity. And in Islam, they also deny that God has any human form. So Muslims would also have a non-anthropomorphic conception of the divinity. Impersonal is not just lacking a human-like shape, body, or form, but lacking a human-like mind with thoughts, feelings, memories, or intentions the way we ordinarily think of them. And believe it or not, there are religions that teach an impersonal view of the sacred, such as Taoism. Now, some Taoists also conceive of the Tao as a personal god or as manifesting or even incarnating as a personal god. But other Taoists do think that the Tao, or the fundamental way uh, of things, so kind of like the first principle of being and becoming, to use more uh, Platonist language, they think of that as transcending all form, but also of, of being impersonal, not being like a human-like mind. Similarly, in Hinduism, there's a notion of Nirguna Brahman, the Brahman, or supreme reality, without form, Nirguna, without properties or qualities. So this is a being, it's not just nothingness, but it's so transcendent that it can't even be thought of in terms of a human-like mind. Um, and I believe that the ancient Platonist conception of the good or the one probably also is best interpreted as a non-anthropomorphic and indeed an impersonal divinity or sacred principle. There's also negative theology, which is difficult to summarize, but it goes along with the idea of the non-anthropomorphic and impersonal views of the divine. It's the view that God so transcends human understanding that he can only be understood, whether in whole or in part, by saying what he is not. So a seeming example of this is the notion of Ein Sof in Jewish Kabbalah. You can see a partial diagram of this in the slide. Um, this is the notion that God, you might say in his inmost nature, uh, is so transcendent as to have no form, cannot be described directly. But Kabbalah, probably under the influence, incidentally, of ancient Neoplatonism and early medieval Neoplatonism, develops a notion of emanations of God from Ein Sof into increasing degrees of materiality, which is also being expressed in this diagram. Um, and so with these emanations, God actually does become describable in positive terms, but Ein Sof is not. And so a negative theology would seem to apply to Ein Sof specifically. Um, another probable example of negative theology is in the Upanishads, some of the um, interpretations of the Veda that are mystical and transcendent, typically in Hinduism, they describe Nirgun Brahman as neti neti, not this, not that, i.e. can't be describable in any form or fashion. A uh, second type of religious belief is a cosmology or a theory of the nature or overall structure of the world or cosmos. A common example is the three worlds cosmology shared by many traditional religions, which divides the universe or the cosmos into an upper world, sky, a middle world or earth, and an underworld. 
Um, the sky is often associated with the sky god, a king or queen of heaven, ancestors, and other helpful spirits. There can be gods and spirits associated with celestial objects or phenomena, like the sun, the moon, and stars, for example. The earth or middle world is where humans live. It's often associated with an earth god or goddess uh, and many other spirits of the earth or of nature. And then the underworld is generally associated with death, but also with fertility, often with serpents like Nagas in ancient Indian religion or dragons and a god of the dead like Hades. And the connection to fertility is probably that plants uh, are placed into the earth where they sprout and grow and give food. Um, and you can see this, for example, in the myth of Demeter, Persephone, and Hades in ancient Greek religion. The diagram on the slide is a modern reconstruction of ancient Jewish cosmology based on the Hebrew Bible, which is an example of the three worlds cosmology. Above is heaven or the firmament, in the middle is earth, and below is Sheol, or the land of the dead, the grave, you might say. There's also a notion of a great deep, or waters, upon which the earth floats. Many ancient religions also had a notion of the primordial waters of creation, or the primordial waters in which the earth um, floats and is surrounded. You can see that in ancient Greek religion, for example with the belief in the river ocean that surrounds everything. A third type of religious belief is a cosmogony or a theory of the origin, the beginning and early history of the world. These are often creation stories. There are actually two examples of this in the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible. Genesis one has the six day creation story and Genesis two has the Garden of Eden story with Adam and Eve being named. And there are similarities between the two, but there's also some differences as well. It's actually fairly common for religions or cultures to have multiple creation stories in this way. Although sometimes there's only one or one that became most salient and popular in the culture. A fourth type of religious theory is a psychology. Again, not in the modern scientific sense, but in the sense of a philosophical psychology or just a theory of the nature of the soul, mind, self, or consciousness. Psychology, the word, is from Greek psuche, which means soul, and logos, which means a theory. So this is a theory of the soul, and most religions have this. Uh, an example of a modern um, more philosophical or scientific psychology is the mind-brain identity theory, which says that the mind of a person is the same as their brain. The soul theory is a very common one taught by religions, which is that the mind is identical to, or at least dependent on metaphysically, a non-material substance, the soul. Uh, in Indian religion, especially Hinduism, there's the theory of Atman, which is that the true self is not the same as the body, so it's like soul theory, but it regards the true self as being different from the ordinary sense of the mind. So the true self or Atman is purely transcendent, pure consciousness, which is often equated with Brahman or the divine consciousness. But in any event, the individual ego or self with its own thoughts, feelings, and memories is actually not the true self according to the Atman theory. In Buddhism, they teach on Atman or no self or not self. They do believe in consciousness and uh, action, intention, karma, and so a kind of causal continuity of a conscious being over their life and between lives. But they deny that there is a self-existent, self-caused, or eternal and unchanging true self. A fifth type of religious theory or belief is soteriology, which is a theory of salvation or enlightenment and how to attain it. Ancient religions, if you look at animism, Neolithic, and early priestly religions, they often did not have a soteriology. Religions tend to develop soteriologies, historically speaking, around 500 BC and afterwards. And this is also connected with the rise of missionary religions and also mystery religions for that matter. 
an example of a soteriology and Christianity. There's different versions of it in different forms of Christianity, which is going to be generally the case with all of these soteriologies. But in general, Christians would say if you accept that Jesus is God and Messiah and other things associated with that, then you'll be rewarded eternally in the afterlife in heaven. In Islam, the soteriology is to accept that there's no God but God or Allah and that Muhammad is his prophet. And that can be a bit, the major part of getting the eternal reward in paradise. With Hinduism, there's different soteriologies for different sects of Hinduism, but a common one is that you can attain eternal blissful union with the Supreme Self or Atman or the Supreme Being Brahman, which are often equated with each other, by renouncing all karma. So it's purifying your consciousness where you don't even have any karmic intentions or formations. The picture shows uh, the Buddha lighting the way for his followers across the river of Samsara. This is from a modern uh, Thai Buddhist uh, interpretation. The Buddha is often regarded as someone who, with his Dharma or teaching, shows the path to the far shore, the safe place. Samsara, or the cycle of death, rebirth, uh, reincarnation, if you will, is often depicted as a flooding river, which is dangerous. It's actually not good. It'll sweep you away because even though you're constantly reborn, you're constantly suffering and dying and experiencing loss as well. And the Buddha's Dharma is supposed to help lead you out of that. So you can see people are swimming to salvation to the further safe shore by following the light of the Buddha. A sixth type of religious belief is eschatology, or a theory of the afterlife, or it can sometimes include a theory of the end of the world. Examples are the notion of the day of judgment or the day of the Lord in Christianity and Islam, when God will judge humans at the end of the world, will reward the righteous in heaven and punish the sinful in hell. In, re in Hinduism, there's a belief in reincarnation, which is that after the death of the old body, the individual self or soul, which can be called the jiva or the jiva atman, will be reborn into a new body. And that will only continue until it is able to unite with the supreme being, Brahman, or discover its true self, Atman. Um, and then in Buddhism, there's a similar belief, which is often termed rebirth, to distinguish it metaphysically from the Hindu view. Buddhists agree with Hindus that there is a reincarnation, so to speak, but they deny the soul theory, so they give a different account metaphysically of how the rebirth occurs, specifically the karmic formations or intentions of the deceased sentient being are causally conditioning a new sentient being to be reborn in a new body. So that's it for our introduction to religion. Next up, we're going to have a lecture and video on ancient religions, specifically of the Middle East and um, the Mediterranean. Until next time.